three, two, one. Here we go. Welcome to the Last Breath Huntcast. My name is Garrett Bulkus, and I'm your host. This is episode 188, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about September trail cameras. What do I do? Why do I do it? And really, how does that evolve into the beginning of fall? So before we do that, though, I want to just touch base and thank the people that make this podcast possible. Pun intended, speaking of trail cameras, I'd like to thank Vulture Mobile, Mark Olis, and the entire team over there have been awesome friends and partners of ours for a long time. Their new Edge Pro camera is freaking awesome. And if, if you don't want to jump up quite to the Cadillac, you can get their Workhorse, which is the Edge series. You can get a double pack. I think that takes those cameras down to around $80, $75 a piece. Um, <clears throat> my father-in-law actually just started running the Edges, and um, he's been a Moultrie user for several years, and he said he just was really impressed with how easy they were to use and how nice the setup and the trail camera pictures, the quality was. So again, Moultrie Mobile, um, I, I utilize cell cameras. I know there's some guys out there that just uh, will die on the freaking limb that they think that cell cameras are somehow, some way ruining or tarnishing um, the hunting culture and experience. Teach their own. But um, then again, I'll, I'll put my wall against most other people. So I, I, I love cell cameras. I love Moultrie Mobile. And if you guys are interested in them, you should check them out. Next is Tompkins Taxidermy. Michael and Wayne have got a gaggle of stuff of mine over there. Uh, Wayne is actually working on Hershey's right now. I've got my rattlesnake. I, I made a custom plaque for it. Um, that snake is over six foot long, and it's a big bastard. Michael is, is mounting that. I'm pretty pumped because I'm going to have to rearrange the shed this year. I've got some really cool stuff that I'm just super jacked to be able to, to have forever and put on the wall. So Tompkins Taxidermy, they're in Muscatine, Iowa. If you're in the greater Quad City area, or realistically within two hours of a drive, um, you should do yourself a favor, look them up, and just see the value that you're going to get from going there. Next is Dark Night Outdoors. Jamie Hoffman is the guru when it comes to playing in the dark. I'm telling you right now, if you are interested in thermal or night vision, tripods, calls, any of that stuff, you need to get a hold of them. The big game changer for me is communication. Both Tompkins, my previous you know, the previous sponsor, uh, they, they're fantastic about communicating. Moultrie Mobile, they have seven days a week, live United States-based customer agents. Communication is awesome. And Dark Knight Outdoors, when you get on the phone with Jamie, he will spend 15 minutes or 90 minutes with you to go over what you need. And then when you get to the shop and you begin to hold the thermals in your hands and go through all the features and settings, that's where, to me, as a consumer, you see the difference. So being able to have that that personal interaction, that communication, having somebody who is extremely knowledgeable in their field that takes the time to walk you through it, whether, like I said, whether it's a multi-camera, whether it's a deer mount, you want to know what's the best way to show off that buck, or if it's something that you're stepping into with a thermal game, communication is key. So Dark Knight Outdoors, give Jamie a call. You will not be disappointed. And when you call him too, that's when you get the real deals. Um, That's how you save a ton of money. Last is Pulsar Products. Been running Pulsar for now for a little while. Um, Actually had some really cool stuff that I was able to do for them um, with some depredation tags. And um, I'm just, I'm I'm really impressed. The quality is there. The technology is there. And again, uh, being a modern outdoorsman, their app is a big game changer for me uh, compared to some of the other companies that I've used. But Pulsar, check them out. I'm running the Thermion Duo right now. Might change that to just a standard XP later on in the year, but we'll see. Now... Let's get the quote of the day done. Uh, As you guys know, I've been doing this now for several podcasts. I'm a quote junkie, literally have a notebook. I scratch them all down. But the quote of the day today is that when you pray for rain, you have to deal with the mud. And uh, boy, isn't that true. You know, success doesn't come without jealousy. Success doesn't come without hardship. And uh, so so just know that when when you're hoping for something fantastic, you know, that there shouldn't always be necessarily strings attached to it, but just know um, you, you got to deal with with the consequences of, of doing that or earning it or getting it, right? And most of those consequences are good things, but sometimes it's not. All right. <clears throat> Episode 188, let's get into trail cameras. Uh, I've been using trail cameras realistically ever since I started deer hunting. Um, and I mean, I'm talking when I was 14 years old. It seemed like that was when wild games were the thing. You were filling up with D-cell or C-cell batteries. Uh, You had a 2 gigabyte or a 512 megabyte SD card. Um, 
they had like the cheap little cords that would attach to the tree or the bungee cords that would go to the tree. And it was just addicting. Um, and, and so the camera game has evolved incredibly. I mean, it went from, for me, it went from very simple white flash cameras. Then it, you got the IR cameras. Then it became into, you know, multi-burst and time-lapse settings. And you got into video settings. Quality started to go through the roof. Um, you had all these new features, 4K video and sound and audio. And then all of a sudden, the cell cameras came onto the game and they're continuing to adapt um, to this day. And so I used cameras pretty much throughout the entire year. Um, and when it comes to deer hunting, I really focus on cameras probably right about now through February or March when I'm hunting deer. I am a little unorthodox. Do I like velvet pictures and footage? Yes, I do. No, I love velvet deer. They just, they look so great. They've got that slick coat, short hair. The bucks are that beautiful reddish brown color. And, you know, they're, they're just some of the prettiest pictures I think that you can get on your trail cameras are those velvet deer. But that being said, I've only killed one deer in my life where I've had velvet pictures of them. And that being said, it was a, it was a unique situation. And that deer just, it was TJ. If you guys want to watch the episode, that buck was a, a total homebody and uh, cultivated his, his bedroom, if you will. And, and the only deer, like I said, that I've been fortunate enough to harvest that I actually had velvet history with. Now, that being said, almost all my other deer, I have plenty of history with. However, it's all hardhorn. And unless you have a, a very large tract of land, I think that you're going to find that you'll probably have something similar to that note where most of the deer that you find that you're hunting during season probably aren't the same ones that you had in velvet. And uh, that just is because I, I believe that when deer do shed their velvet, they change. They go from their summer pattern to their fall pattern. And um, that's why I really focus on September and on specifically September and October are probably my most influential camera data months that I'm utilizing to try to kill a deer that's not a rut buck. And so let's talk about cams. I do have some cameras out and I, I've, you know, obviously getting some pictures and, and I'm pumped about it, but I'm going to be making a big shift here pretty soon. And I'm going to be moving my count, almost all my trail cameras around. And so right now they've been on, you know, bean field edges and alfalfa edges, and those are still really good places to keep them, especially if you're continuing to get uh, photos that you want. But the thing that is uh, a big thing for me is that some of these food sources are, are, are going to start to change. And September is typically one of those months where you'll start to find that your beans are going to start turning. Uh, you know, and I'm talking about in later in September, your corn is going to start turning. And a lot of times your farmers are, are probably getting ready to do their last cutting of hay or alfalfa. So I would say that alfalfa is probably going to be your best bet, your, your clover blends, those hay blends, the alfalfa blends for your longer f palatable food options for deer. And um, if you've got some late beans, yes, I would definitely keep, keep on them. But generally speaking, you know, most of the Midwest opens up around October 1st. And if you you think about that, a lot of your beans have probably already turned by then. Sometimes you can get lucky in that first weekend. Um, you have the ability to hunt over those green beans where deer are still feeding in them. But again, just mind you, it's, it's a timing thing that whenever those beans decide to go, I mean, you've seen them. They go from green to gold pretty quick. And once they get in that yellowish color, they just they seem to not be nearly as attractive to deer as, uh, as they are when they're nice and luscious and green. So just keep that in mind. I, I move my cameras around as those food sources are going to begin to change. I think that bedding changes and bedding's going to begin to change because of several different factors. Again, uh, it has a lot to do with the crops. Some farmers will begin to cut silage in September. Obviously that affects a lot of that farm. If you are, uh, uh, if you have a farm that's being cut for silage and also again, going back to that that velvet scraping, the removal of velvet, I've noticed that a lot of times when my deer do shed their velvet and strip their velvet, it is a, it's, it's like almost immediate. It's as soon as they get that velvet off, they've changed their habits and those deer will migrate to or close to their fall core area. And in relatively quick turnaround time from when they shed their velvet. So keep that in mind, especially if you have deer that you know 
prefer an area of the farm during the fall. That's where I'm going to rely on my historical data, not necessarily time, dap, time and date stamped where, where I'm like, ah, this guy was on this scrape on October 15th in the morning. Not that, but more so historical data of saying, ah, this deer really frequented this part of the farm come hunting season. And so what I'm doing is I'm moving my cameras around there to try to preemptively beat him to it, right? I want to make sure that I get there and that as soon as that deer starts to frequent that area again, I start collecting my data immediately. And so I can start putting a game plan together to hunt that deer in October. So um, the, the other thing that's important to note too, is that after the velvet begins to shed, I think you'll find those deer break up. Those bachelor groups begin to dismantle. You'll have some younger group or bucks that still stay together. But again, this is where you're going to find those more mature deer are going to separate themselves from that bachelor group. They're going to start carving out their core areas. And that's where, again, I'm going back to that historical data where you're like, ah, I, I remember this buck was in this area more than anywhere else on the farm. And you can start looking at that by your, your ex camera data. Another big thing for me in September is that I really like to start, this is when I really start to activate my mock scrapes. Um, there's a video up on YouTube of how I create one. I pretty much still use those same products, even that video is about five years old. I think a couple of the big things about those is that I, I usually make my mock scrapes in historical areas. And I found that those will generate, you know, a high productivity camera and especially buck areas in the same place year after year. I have made new mock scrapes in September on places that, like maybe it's a new farm, or maybe it's an area where I like, rem I, I dropped a pin and I said, I knew that there was a scrape here. It was for, you know, primarily deer X, and I want to make sure that I jump to it. But in September, generally around the 12th to 15th is when I like to start those scrapes up. And I think you'll find that if you do that, you have a much greater chance of conditioning that buck to start either using that scrape or to start challenging that scrape, especially later on in October. When you make these mock scrapes, you don't give up on them, especially if it's in a spot where you knew there was a scrape last year or if you knew that it's, a, it's been a producing place in years of the past with mock scrapes. Sometimes you'll have a couple deer hit it and then it'll go dormant for a little bit. Don't give up on it. But uh, key notes on that is that I always use white oak licking branches. Uh, I just, I, I'm telling you, I am a humongous believer in that. They hold the leaves really well. The, the branch is really malleable. They're not sticky. They're not pokey. And I've just, without any hesitation, if somebody asked me, what would you use for a mock scrape branch? It's going to be white oak. Next, I'm, you know, I'm going to be using the scrape mate in it the, itself. I'm, and this is a, a real talk. I'm not in working with Code Blue by any means, but... Uh, the Grave Digger Scrape Mate is just an awesome product to start it. It'll expose that bare dirt, whether it's with a weed whacker or a yard rake. You want to make sure and open that scrape up and put that, that attractant in there. And then I do use, you know, a, a lot of the, the licking branch gels and other things that go on there, again, just to activate it and start it. But when it comes to cameras, I'm moving those cameras immediately to those mock scrapes. I want to start monitoring who's coming to it and how often. And the other thing that I do with these cameras is uh, whether it's during season or right now, you know, preseason, I'm running them on video mode. I think you can get so much information on those cameras on video mode that uh, it's, it's worth it. And I know that if you're going to run like a cellular camera or mobile data, it's a little bit, a little bit more arduous because you're restricted usually or those video packages are more expensive. But um, I, I've even gone to the point where I'll take a regular camera and put it on video mode and then have a cell camera on photo mode just so I can keep tabs on who's going there. But when I need to really dive in or if I want those videos, I'll go pull the other one. Caveat to that, though, is that when they both go off, boy, the IR flash is like, whoa, bright. So don't think that your camera's messing up if you do burn two cameras on that same scrape because when the, both those IR flash go off, you'll have, you'll have more illumination. Um, I think the, the last important little tidbit here of like cameras in September that's important to me is that it's, it's huntable camera Intel. And so going back to like the velvet facade, I, I love knowing what deer are in the area and I love getting those pictures of those deer. And, and I'm sure that my tune would be a lot different if, if maybe the farms that I had held the deer from, you know, January 1 to January 1, but I just, I know they don't. 
so I, I just, uh, I don't put a lot of context into it, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you get a lot of data or pictures of a deer in July, I'm not really sure, or even August, I'm not really sure how much that transfers into being able to kill that deer come season. And so uh, again, going back to where I'm, I've said it and I will say it probably 10 more times in this podcast is just getting those pictures are cool but it doesn't really tell me much about how I'm going to hunt that deer in the fall. And moving your cameras around in September to huntable camera data is what is important to me because that is when I begin to catalog specifically when they go hard horned, where is this deer primarily at? Where is he going in and out of the field? What scrapes are he using? You know, and I'm starting to stack pile all of this data up of this deer because he is hard horn now the opportunity of him being on the farm or the same pattern specifically as it comes into later september for me to be able to hunt that deer during season becomes much much more weighted and so that to me is worth kind of waiting staying out of the farms you know i'm doing my regular trail maintenance food plots stand maintenance etc but just not really running the cameras hot and heavy. I think the other thing to make note of it is that when I'm talking about huntable data, a lot of my cameras begin to shift more so around where I plan to hunt. And uh, I've talked about this in other podcasts in the past that during season, I usually will try to keep a trail camera within pretty close proximity or multiple cameras within pretty, pretty close proximity of a stand that I'm planning on hunting. Because that's the data that's really important to me. You know, if you, especially if you have preset stands that are hung and you plan to go and and sit there, you know, that's, that to me is super important. And I will say this in the same, in the same breath that the camera doesn't capture all, all the movement without a doubt. I've had mornings where they've been absolutely lights out white hot and seen 40 deer, but only two of them walked past the trail camera that I had there. So just know that that just because a camera is not necessarily firing doesn't mean that there aren't deer walking past your camera. But you do know that if the camera is capturing photos of deer or specifically your target deer that are in the same area or obviously if it's in a killable location from your deer stand, you know for a fact, all right, this guy is is in the area and I need to get in there and hunt it when I have the right wind or when the conditions are right, etc. So by moving my cameras around into more of those hunting scenario situations. I haven't quite dove them in yet. So September is still, I'm, I'm not necessarily running deep into like the, there's a place that I call the trench. I'm not necessarily running cameras in there just yet, but I'm, I'm getting a lot closer to. And I've, I've already got my exit plan in and out, et cetera, but I'm just, I'm beginning to compile data to know, okay, this deer is doing this and that when I go in to hang my stands, I've been adopting not, I don't say mobile, I'm not quite like crazy ass man, Cody Jenkins, who carries a stand in and out every time, but I am very reactive. And so like, I will have probably four stands hung, pre-hung on this property. I'm chasing Chachi this year. He's my number one. And really like, I'm going to focus pretty hard on him this year. There's another deer that is very nice um, on a different piece. But I just don't know if he's going to be there um, come season. To being honest, the the new the new place that I have to hunt isn't very big, but um, he he is a he's a damn nice deer, and uh, would definitely get an arrow or a bullet if I saw him. Um, but I just it, it's new, it's all new, and I I highly doubt that he'll be around. Maybe, but we will see. He's just been in velvet. So getting back to Chachi, I'm going to have some some stands, four of them that I know are producing stands. And two of them specifically are going to be just for him. And I'll always keep like an extra stand and maybe a set of sticks in reserve. Because if something pops up where I'm like, man, I need to get into this corner. I need to get on this ridge. I need to change my setup. I don't necessarily want to sacrifice one of my good producing spots and take my stand over there and then be like, oh, man, I wish I was had that other spot where the it's set up for the northwest wind. I like to take that mobile setup, as I call it, or like I guess the the floating setup would be a better term for it, and use that to move around. So I guess in closing, making this podcast, boy, this is a quick one, 20 minutes. So um, 
my September camera movement is is done with purpose. And it's again, it's it's realistically mostly around being able to take that those pictures, those videos, look at them, analyze them, not use them as inventory anymore, but but really start to break it down and know where the bucks that I'm going to be hunting are moving, why they're moving there, and then how I can get myself into position to kill them. I will say that that I continue to add cameras to the property and I continue to move cameras as hunting season gets closer. Um, I don't deploy all of my cameras right now. I really like to keep several, probably half a dozen in reserve for those scrapes that pop up, those big, giant, just obnoxious ones. Or if, um, say, say the farmer opens up a field, but then we get a lot of rain and he can't get back in there. It's a great opportunity to throw a camera to see, okay, what are these deer using this little corner that just got opened up? Um, or say that a, a tree blows down and changes path or, or something along those lines. Like there's a lot of different things that you can do with those reserve cameras instead of throwing them out. So I will say that, that I have about 50% of my cameras out in September. They are put out with purpose. And I think it should, your, your camera setup in September should look a lot different than it would in say July and August. But that being said, I've got some pretty cool stuff coming up. This is uh, this podcast going to launch a little bit differently. It's unorthodox. It's probably going to launch on a Tuesday instead of a Monday. That's my fault. But uh, I'll be in Colorado um, beginning September, and I'll be hunting mule deer. You probably listened to the previous podcast about that. I'm going to grab all this stuff, and I'm going to pack it out there with me, and I'm going to get Shane and Robert and maybe some of the other guys that are out there on the podcast. Hopefully we can talk about the hunt itself and the success, but I also want to have those guys just share with you some of their hunting stories. I mean, I know that that's, that's what just totally immerses me is listening to those stories and Robert and Shane, Tyler, Daryl, Robert's dad, they all have tons of awesome stories. So I'm going to see if, uh, if we can sacrifice an evening and get those guys all around the mics to talk and uh, try to record a couple of them while we're out there. But um, I can't promise that I will have a podcast out for the next Monday. So that that Monday will be the Labor Day, which is the 4th. But I promise you that I will have a podcast, multiple podcasts for September from the Western Slope of Colorado. As always, thank you for listening. Appreciate you guys' support. If you want to follow along on the hunt, make sure you tap into the inner circle because that's where I'll be posting the updates. Don't waste it.